And we're back. After a brief hiatus from this series, I wanted to come back with a spotlight video of sorts. Similar to what I did for the Giallo video last Halloween, I wanted to take that episode's structure and apply it to a different subject. Today's, of course, being low to mid-budget movies. Now, what is a low-budget or mid-budget movie? Well, it's pretty self-explanatory, but what's not is what constitutes each uh, number-wise. Now, most people's definition of a mid-budget movie, uh, the cutoff point for a budget is $50 million. I'm getting nowhere near that number today, uh, nor am I here to bore you with numbers. What I'm doing is taking modestly budgeted genre movies and showcasing how not only they work in their respective genres, but how they all have clear, distinct visions that shine through. And if I sound congested at all, I'm coming off of a cold right now, so I thought, what better time to break the six month silence on my channel than right now. Uh, without further ado, here we go. So first, I want to talk about the movie The Guard, which is a comedy crime movie that was written and directed by John Michael McDonough. It was also his first feature film and the first time he would work with Irish actor Brendan Gleeson, who I know best from the movie In Bruges, but in this film he plays the tired, foul-mouthed cop Jerry Boyle, who works in Connemara, which is in West Ireland. The way this movie opens is so funny, because it says so much about Jerry's character, but it also sets up the type of humor as well as the tone of this movie so well. So Jerry's in his cop car out in the countryside, and this car full of punks just flies by going way too fast. They are presumably have or doing drugs and drinking, uh, they're blaring music, they're driving recklessly, and they swerve off the road and crash. And all of this barely gets uh, any reaction out of Jerry. He just kind of rolls his eyes. So it kind of seems like same old stuff to him. He pulls up to the scene of the crime, finds psychedelic drugs on one of the kids, and he proceeds to do the drugs, and that's how we meet the hero of our movie. What a beautiful fucking day. So yeah, Jerry is more than a little rough around the edges, to say the least. Uh, he's pretty unprofessional, he does drugs, he drinks a ton, he sleeps around with prostitutes. He's got a very loose grasp on his morals as a whole. The first bit of conflict in the movie comes into play when Aiden McBride gets assigned to work with Jerry, who of course is none too happy about this decision. The two of them could not be more opposite. Jerry is, of course, Jerry. Uh, and Aiden is very proper uh, and seems to be a more by-the-books cop. Uh, that is until they start to unravel him and reveal some of his flaws, too. Uh, this movie is really, really funny early on, uh, and some of the bits with Aiden got a lot of laughs out of me. Uh, it seems to be most of the knowledge that he has as a working cop was pulled from movies and cop TV shows. Five and a half. Five and a half. Maybe this is the killer's five and a half, half victim. Maybe he's killed four people before now and he's maimed another lad. Cut off his legs, maybe, which would be the half. So this would be victim number five and a half. So he's really just spitballing. It's like he watched Seven the night before he went on the job. And so their dynamic early on is really, really funny. Of course, it doesn't work out and the two characters part ways, but I really did enjoy their back and forth, no matter how short it may have been. Jerry does start to show his know-how as a cop and detective when he ties the murder into drug smuggling, which of course ends up being true. That's when he and Aiden part ways and they bring in an American FBI agent who's played by Don Cheadle. His name is Wendell and he's your typical hard cop, uh, no funny business, and of course he and Jerry immediately butt heads. There's this fantastic debriefing scene that I think is one of the highlights of the movie for me. Now these men are highly dangerous. In the vicinity of $500 million worth of cocaine on board. Yes, Sergeant. I thought only black lads were throat dealers. And Mexicans. Apologize to the man. Apologize for what? For your racist slurs, for one thing. 
I'm Irish, sir. Racism is part of my culture. You have Don Cheadle's character, Wendell, who's very closed off and, uh, you know, professional. Everything he says is very calculated. And you get to Jerry and he just says whatever comes to his mind. Of course, these deeper flaws in Jerry uh, is just him trying to build a shell around himself from keeping people... Uh, from looking in and seeing him on a deeper level. Uh, it's abundantly clear uh, in the intro with that Aiden character I mentioned earlier. He and Jerry are having a conversation and Jerry says something along the lines of like, oh, you think I'm just a lowly country cop, right? And uh, Aiden says like, lonely, he, like he mishears him and this really ticks Jerry off. He's like, lonely? I didn't say lonely, I said lowly. Aiden, you hit the nail on the head and you weren't even trying to. So Wendell investigates around West Ireland, uh, but he doesn't have too much luck. Uh, everyone's either speaking Gaelic, or they're being rude to him, or they're being rude to him in Gaelic, so he doesn't really get very far. How you doing, sir? Sir? And that's kind of when he realizes that Jerry does have value, and he does need to kind of work with him, no matter how reluctantly he has to do so. Well into the first act, we meet our main villains. They humanize these characters in a pretty interesting way too. They're all pretty funny. They're sitting in a car and they're discussing philosophy. I think they're talking about Nietzsche and who knows, uh, you know, how many Nietzsche quotes. They talk about Bertrand Russell too, but they're using all of these philosophers as like a pissing contest. So it's kind of like that perception, people's perception of philosophy and using knowledge as a weapon rather than a tool. That's a pretty big part of the movie as well. Now I said this is a crime comedy, that's definitely the case. Uh, there is a little action in it. There are a lot of tropes that the movie kind of plays with. There will be characters who will try and say like a cool like action movie line or try to sound sinister, but they hold on it and it the line doesn't really work in like the context of the situation. Like a donkey fucking hippopotamus. It's party time. What? Those moments kind of had me thinking of Hot Fuzz in the sense that that movie uh, kind of deconstructs all the action movie tropes until they eventually give in to them at the end because at the end of the day they are so much fun. Another stray example of this is uh, Mark Strong's character, Clive, looks directly into the camera at one point and says like, I like sharks. I find them soothing. And they just hold on that. It's just so goofy. Uh, I love that the movie, um, it's well grounded within its own world. It takes the story seriously, but it, it's not afraid to have moments that kind of take a step back and kind of poke fun at the more goofier elements. So of course, Wendell and Jerry are brought together. They're the unlikely duo of this story, but I love that this movie took the route that it did. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll see uh, buddy cop or, you know, road trip movies, whatever the case may be, where you have an unlikely pair and they're forced to come together. And over the course of the movie, they uh, become friends magically. And it doesn't always feel organic. I like that this movie went the route more of like respect. There's a great uh, rural cop slash city cop dynamic, neither of which of the two understand the other at first, but as they learn more about each other, they kind of start to grow a fondness and respect for that. There's a lot of fun to be had with this movie. It's got meta moments, there's an oddball sense of humor throughout with great running gags, uh, one of which uh, that stood out to me was when Wendell introduces himself as an FBI agent, characters will light up and get interested and then he'll, they'll ask like, oh, behavioral science unit? And he'll say, no, no, I, I'm in the drug unit. And they kind of, mm, okay, they deflate and get uninterested in the conversation, which was really funny. Um, and there's genuine heart to be found within this movie. Well, still staying in the realm of possibilities with these characters and when it comes down to it and there is action in the movie it's really fun it's well shot and it's it's exhilarating it's cool that John Michael McDonough got a chance to work on a kind of higher concept creative vision you know this was his baby he wrote it directed it and it's cool to see his first movie out of the gates work on so many levels
Our second film today is Ty West's The House of the Devil. Now I thought this would be a good one to talk about, especially because Ty West's new movie X was recently released. So I wanted to rewind time a little bit and talk about one of his earlier works with a much lower budget. Now this movie takes place in 1980s Connecticut and it's very uh, akin to the style of 80s and 70s especially, uh, lower budgeted horror movies that were being released at the time. The movie opens with a legitimate statistic about the occult in the 1980s, followed by an illegitimate statement that this movie is in fact based on a true story. But there's a reason for both. Uh, the statistic I mentioned uh, came from in the 1980s. Uh, it never really went away, but it was really prominent in this decade in particular. There was the whole satanic panic. I'm sure you guys have all heard of this to one degree or another, but essentially what it was was a bunch of faceless claims were being made that um, Satan worshippers were kidnapping people and putting them in these insane rituals without any proof of this whatsoever. And the based on a true story bit was added to the opening credits because Ty West felt it accented this film style as well as the movies it was paying homage to as well as the fact that he felt that it would be something that would immediately catch the viewer's attention, that would make them lock into this movie and take the story with full severity. So I thought that was a pretty clever way of tricking the audience into thinking what they were watching was more or less legitimate. And the movie's style is great. It was shot on 16 millimeter film. It's got an amazing look to it. It's very grainy, it has a lot of depth to its shots. And I love the little all rights reserved bumper put under the title of the movie as it opens. Just little details like that show how much love uh, was put into the craft of this film. The plot for this movie is super simple. It follows a young woman named Samantha who really needs money for her new place. So she accepts a babysitting job that has more than its fair share of red flags. Samantha is played wonderfully by Jocelyn Donahue. She really captures the quietly desperate character of Samantha, who's a little naive and slowly being led to her doomed fate. And they do a really good job of showing how undesirable her current living situation is. A detail that horror buffs are bound to appreciate is the appearance of Dee Wallace of horror fame, and in this movie plays the landlord for Samantha's new place. So Samantha is walking around her university's campus and she comes across a flyer on this public bulletin board that says babysitter wanted. And amongst this flyer and other flyers are printouts for a coming lunar eclipse in the area. Now this is the first little bit of the lunar eclipse that we get mentioned. Uh, characters bring it up throughout the movie and it becomes an increasingly bigger and bigger deal as the movie goes along. So Samantha calls the number from the ad and no one picks up. Uh, she hangs up and then immediately they call back. Samantha picks up the phone and talks to Mr. Olman, who we kind of start to get the idea isn't all there, but the job does sound promising enough. So Samantha agrees to meet him somewhere on campus just a few minutes later because he urgently needs this babysitter for whatever reason. She waits for presumably an hour and no one shows. And even though this movie is minimalist in a lot of ways, there is so much personality packed into it. Uh, for example, after Samantha gets stood up, she goes to a pizzeria to talk with her friend Megan and there's a little sign uh, at the pizzeria. I mentioned the lunar eclipse earlier and there's a sign that's advertising lunar pies or like moon pies or something like that. Just small little details like that give this movie a lot of life. So Samantha is talking to her friend Megan, who's played by none other than Greta Gerwig. Uh, it was really cool to see her pop up in this movie. It was earlier on in her acting career, but she gets to display her full charm here. So Samantha airs her frustrations to Megan about Mr. Ullman standing her up, but she also shares her fears about not being able to pay for her place on time. To which Megan responds with, hey, you know, because her family's very well off. She says, if it comes down to it, my dad can cover your first month's rent. It's no problem. And it was a storytelling decision at first I was unsure of, but they smartly use it to build Samantha's depth as a character. Samantha immediately turns this offer down. It shows that Samantha is a young woman who is transitioning from teenage childhood to adulthood and trying to bridge that gap. 
So Samantha, being overwhelmed with her situation, goes into a dormitory bathroom, flips on all the faucets, and sits in a stall by herself and quietly sobs. However, Mr. Ullman does get back in contact with Samantha. He apologizes for the whole mishap, and he starts to use some very cryptic uh, wording and phrasing. Uh, so he says they did find another woman for the job originally, uh, but he says the last girl was uh, unreliable and the whole thing was disastrous. He says they're in dire need of a babysitter. It's a lot more intense than what you would think a conversation about a babysitting ad would go, but he offers a good chunk of money and Samantha reluctantly accepts. So the bathroom scene where Samantha breaks down and has to give herself a pep talk to bring herself back up, followed by the phone conversation uh, she has with Mr. Ullman, really show Jocelyn Donahue's strengths as an actress. Seeing her raw emotions of hopelessness in the bathroom scene really help you understand Samantha's desperation and willingness to accept this babysitting job despite her better judgment. And Donahue's effective pauses during the phone call, as well as her uneasy voice and her facial acting, really help sell this moment. The phone conversation gets a little weirder when Mr. Ullman says that he needs the babysitting job to be done that very night, as in when Samantha hangs up the phone, she should probably be on her way. So Megan, being the good friend that she is, picks up Samantha to take her to the Ullman's house but understandably has her reservations about the whole thing in general. There's a small little exchange that I love between Megan and Samantha when Megan first picks her up. It really kind of spoke a lot about these two's relationship and how long they've probably known each other. So Jeff Grace composed the score for this movie, and it's fantastic. There are points in the movie where you can barely hear it, but it's this soft piano score that's just present enough to really make you uneasy and get under your skin. But there's one moment in particular that I thought it worked really, really well. So Samantha and Megan arrive at the front doorstep of the Ullman house, and the Ullman house itself is nothing really out of the ordinary. It's a nice house out in the woods. There's nothing odd about it, but there's definitely something odd about Mr. Ullman himself. There's the age-old argument with every horror movie ever, where people say, why doesn't this character just leave? If things have gotten this bad, why doesn't the character just get out of there like a normal person? Uh, but this movie kind of combats that really effectively. There's red flags to be sure, but we know that Samantha is desperate enough for this money that she's willing to look past some of those things. The warning signs aren't quite big enough in the moment, so we as an audience can understand why Samantha wouldn't just walk away. So with Samantha having accepted the job, Megan leaves saying that she'll come back to pick her up once it's all said and done, but she does not do so without fighting tooth and nail. But Samantha reassures her and the two of them finally part ways, leaving Samantha completely alone in the Ullman house. And this is what a good chunk of the movie is. I was surprised by how well this movie handled its pacing, despite a lot of it being just one character kind of hanging out in the house. There's one moment in particular where once Samantha finally gets comfortable, she decides to put on her Walkman and dance around the house and listen to some 80s jams. Everything's fine, seemingly so, uh, but there's one shot in particular. I mentioned the score before, but this movie's sound design in general is just really solid. Samantha opens the door to this basement and every moment in this scene beforehand, the music is diegetic, but we as an audience are hearing it as loudly as Samantha would with her headphones on. However, when we cut to this shot of the basement, she looks down the stairs and all the while, the music cuts and we hear it with distance as it would kind of sound from someone listening in the basement. And it's a really, really nice choice to use that here in this shot in particular, 
Samantha doesn't really find any interest in the basement, so she kind of just shrugs and closes the door. But man, when it cuts back to the song, it does not sound the same from that moment on. Choices like that help this movie's slow pace build and build and build and make you just feel more and more uncomfortable as it goes along and make you question, what is this story building up to? But I'm not gonna say what it builds up to because that would spoil the surprise. I will say this movie is terrific. Um, I really, really enjoyed it thoroughly. I'd wanted to check it out for a long time because I'm a pretty big Ty West fan, at least from what I've seen of his work, and I'm a big horror fan. I didn't realize how much this movie would get to me though. The ending of this film is genuinely terrifying and it just got under my skin. I can only describe the whole experience as disturbing and on rewatches for this video, I found the rest of the movie to be just as scary knowing what it was leading up to. Uh, I would highly recommend it if you're into this type of thing. Uh, I think it's right up any horror buff, Sally, and I had a great time with The House of the Devil. The last film I'm going to be talking about today is David Mitrod's The Rover, which stars Guy Pearce and Robert Pattinson. Uh, this movie, uh, which was produced by A24, as well as uh, uh, High Life, which came out a couple years after, kind of acted as a career shift for Robert Pattinson, and for good reason. He's really, really good in both of these movies, but I'll get into that a little bit later. This movie takes place in Australia, ten years after what the story calls The Collapse. The film starts with our lead character, Eric, played by Guy Pearce, driving through the apocalyptic wasteland of Australia, and he stops at a makeshift bar to sit down and have a drink. This is the first little glimpse we get of what kind of world we're in. It's been 10 years since the collapse, uh, whatever that means exactly, we don't really know. But I do really like that this movie takes that 10 years after the collapse, it's not immediately after the apocalypse happened and everything, you know, went to hell. It's 10 years after. Society has kind of had time to rebuild in some ways, try to reformulate itself, and have some sort of semblance of government. I really like that. But back to the bar. So Eric is sitting down, he's having a drink, all the while he's left his car parked outside, and a group of criminals drives by. Uh, they recently attempted a bank robbery, it was botched, it went south, and so they're all in the car arguing. Now our eyes into this B story is Henry. He's not the leader of the group, but he's one of the members, and he's in a heated argument with one of the other criminals about having left his brother behind. He doesn't agree with it. They said it was, you know, a choice they had to make, one thing or the other. The argument's bubbling up. It gets physical. The driver loses control of the car, and he crashes. The gang gets out of the car. They see Eric's car. So they immediately hop in his car and take off. They steal Eric's only possession in this hopeless world. So that's what sets up the conflict for this movie. Uh, Eric immediately takes action. He gets in the truck that these criminals just crashed, and he starts it up, and he just tails them. He goes immediately after them. Now this is the first point of the movie where the film kind of feels almost like a minimalist Mad Max movie. Of course, there's the Australian connection, but the way the movie plays out in certain aspects, the inspiration is definitely there. Eric finally gets the gang to pull over. They get out, ask him what he wants. He demands to have his car back, and they knock Eric out and leave him presumably for dead. Why Eric wants his car back so badly is one of the movie's biggest mysteries, but it's also a storytelling device they use to further develop his character. Something else that develops his character comes in the form of Ray, a man that he finds on the side of the road also left for dead. This turns out to be Henry's aforementioned brother, and the two of them get together, again, another unlikely pair movie uh, like The Guard, uh, but this one plays out a lot differently. Uh, the two of them do not get along at all. Eric has been in this world for a long time. He's gotten used to it. He's a lot more hardened. Uh, he's got no hope. He's basically just a shell. Whereas Ray is a little less jaded. He's more optimistic. He's more hopeful. 
a little dim-witted, but as we learn, there's more than meets the eye to this character. Two things I want to talk about in this movie. Natasha Breyer's visuals are fantastic here. Yes, she captures the unforgiving, dry heat of the Australian desert very, very well, but you also get some dark, murky interior visuals uh, matched with the actual quiet, peaceful beauty of the Australian desert, both in the day and night. And that is scored beautifully by Anthony Partos. Uh, his score for this movie is very, very good. It ranges from a soft kind of droning electronic sound to more like ambient, peaceful, beautiful tracks. It's a really nice blend. There is one piece of music I do want to mention. It's pretty deep into the movie. Uh, the stakes have been set relatively high, and all of a sudden, Pretty Rock Girl by Carrie Hilson starts playing. Uh, it ends up being diegetic music. It works to serve the story, uh, but it definitely got a laugh out of me when it first started playing because it feels so out of left field in a movie like this. My name is Carrie. I'm so Eric, as I mentioned earlier, is a very hardened shell of who he used to probably be. Ray is being used by Eric uh, because Ray is Henry's brother, so he takes him along with him and says, you're gonna show me, you know, where, where he is. I want my car back. And of course, Eric has possession of a new vehicle. Granted, it's probably not in the best shape, but there's something deeper going on. We see that through Eric and Ray, especially as the movie goes along, you see his deeper insecurities and fears, and that even starts to crack Eric's shell a little bit. Uh, watching these two on screen was so fun. Uh, they can say so much with so little. Ray does most of the talking for them, uh, much to Eric's uh, chagrin, but it does start to get him to open up a little bit and I found that to be a surprisingly heartwarming part of this movie. So as Eric and Ray travel across the country, they're forced to make terrible decisions, uh, take lives, but you always really feel the impact of that, which is something I really appreciated about this movie. Even with a character like Eric, who's been hardened by this world, you still see the pain of having to take a life. Even if it's like a self-defense situation, it still weighs him down a lot. And you see that with Ray, of course, too, uh, how much that haunts him. And you can kind of see how years of decision making like that and survival instinct would slowly break someone down in a world like this. And it's pretty somber. Um, a lot of it kind of, I mentioned um, Mad Max before, a lot of those comparisons kind of dissipate as the movie goes along. That was just something I initially thought of. Um, but Something that I was definitely going back to in my mind as this movie went along was Cormac McCarthy and some of the books that he's written, The Road and Blood Meridian definitely being the two biggest comparisons. Just the way that this movie handles humanity and ideas of life and death really rang true to something that you would see in a McCarthy novel. So this movie has a lot going for it. Um, I would definitely put it in the category of sci-fi first, uh, but it's an adventure movie. Uh, it's got action. Uh, it, at parts, it's a road trip movie for a good chunk of it. The visuals are beautiful. I really enjoyed the score, but I think the standout here is definitely the performances and the themes that this movie has. Nothing is really spelled out. Different people are gonna get very different things out of this movie uh, because there's a lot of vagueness to it. Uh, like I mentioned before, the outbreak or the collapse itself uh, is very vague. They don't go into details about it. Eric is a very vague protagonist. We root for him for the most part, but you learn things about him as the movie goes along that can kind of alter your perception of him. I like that you kind of have to read into who Eric is as a man, not only now, but who he was before and how far he's come, as well as the world itself. I remember before I had even seen this movie, I'd heard some criticisms about it, that the car itself, not explaining why Eric wants it so badly, 
was a deterrent for a lot of people, that the plot was too simple, and I don't think that, but it does leave you with a lot of thoughts. It admittedly does have the largest budget of all three movies I've talked about today, but even still, I was really impressed that they were able to take a smaller, more modest budget and still wring so much out of it. They made this really believable, hopeless, desolate world feel tangible. The whole movie, it really feels like you're locked into this world. It feels like you're as trapped as the characters. And the fact that they were able to do that on a smaller budget is really inspiring. So those are three low to mid budget movies that I felt hadn't been talked about in a while that I wanted to shed a little light on. I had never seen any of these movies prior to making this video and I had a lot of fun with all three of them. It was cool to see three vastly different genre films all succeed in what they were trying to do. The Guard was a really fun uh, comedy crime film with a good mystery, uh, really memorable characters and good action when it came down to it. Uh, the House of the Devil is a very, very well done, harrowing, terrifying movie with a great build up. And The Rover was a really nice, bleak sci fi movie with some great performances and an odd amount of heart to it as well. Um, so, yeah, I got something different out of all three of these movies. Uh, I'd recommend all of them. I think there's something here for everyone in each of them. And yeah, I'd check them all out. So as always, thank you guys for watching, um, and until next time, take care. I'll see you in six months. <laughs>